I am shocked people are still watching my videos. I did quit my dream job at NASA <laughs> to make YouTube videos. We've been literally filming for four months every single day. It blew out the bottom of it. It failed technically. For a moment, I thought sure. my life was in grave danger. Right. That's the thing maybe that like kills the channel. Your mind's gonna be blown. <laughs> Do not cut that yeah, part yeah, out, yeah. you guys promise. <laughs> I was making more money on YouTube than I was at Apple. There will be billionaire creators, right. a handful of them. Okay, so before we get into this interview with Mark Rober, we wanna thank one of our sponsors who's been making this show possible all year, and that's Jelly Smack. Now, if you don't know by now, Jelly Smack works with some of the biggest creators in the world to help them get their content across multiple platforms. Jelly Smack and the creators they work with had a huge year. They started off by putting up billboards of creators all around the world. They won the most innovative company in video by Fast Company, and they launched two new helpful solutions for creators, Jelly Smash and Jelly Fi. They also just won a Digiday Technology Award, and a bunch of the creators that they work with are nominated for Streamies. So if you're a creator and you're looking to expand your reach and your revenue, reach out to Jelly Smack. The link is in the description. Also, you may have noticed, this is our new studio. We're not gonna talk about it right now, but we will in a future video. Now, for our interview with Mark Rober. Mark, we wanted to start by asking you if you could explain what's happening in this picture. <laughs> oh, wow, we're just getting right to the core, out of the gate, coming in strong. <laughs> Basically, I grew up in a home where it's like, we all chipped in and did chores, and so I was helping with dinner. My mom said, hey, can you cut the onions to help the salad? And so they make you cry. So I like, I, I was like, there's got to be a better way for this. And I was like five years old, I think. So I went upstairs, got our goggles, came down and, and put them on. And so my mom saw that and I remember her laughing and just seeing like, oh, that's a great idea. She took a picture, which back then meant something because you have like 24, it's film, baby, yeah, you know? Yep. To me, that represents like being encouraged to be creative and to come up with solutions and that being like rewarded and feeling like, positive emotions associated with liking a creative idea or like trying to trying to be creative. And so I love that picture because my mom, who's since passed, she passed away from LA, uh, ALS like a decade ago, but she, she passed away like six months before I ever released my first YouTube video. Oh, wow. Mm. Which I think is actually kind of cool because it's like you don't understand the measure of like the impact you have on a life because now I'm reaching a lot of people with this message of like engineering and science and these things. She had no idea when she passed away that that was like a big part of her legacy. And so I think it's a great example of like, just do the right thing and be a good human and try and leave the world as good a place as you possibly can versus what the way you found it. You, you never know the full measure of the impact you have. So just do it anyways. And it's the best possible option. So yeah, that wow. that's, didn't expect that that photo yeah. to go there. Yeah, that was, I thought it was yeah. just going to be goggles for yeah. onions because yeah. they make you cry. We're getting yeah. right into yeah. it. You guys are like you guys are like the Oprah yeah. of YouTube. It's like you have the sound yeah, effect. Yeah. Here we are. Jeez. Yeah, I'm like in two minutes, yeah. I'm going to be on that couch yeah. over there. When you have that realization at five, you know there's got to be a better way. You said when you see mm. that you're crying from mm. onions. When does does that quality about you turn a light switch on that it could be a career? That like when you look at problems and you think there's got to be a better way, that's something that you could do for a living. Like two years ago, like I just quit my job at Apple. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I quit Apple when I had like about 10 million subscribers. So when I first made my first YouTube video a decade ago with like the iPad in front, iPad in back, that was my first experience, I guess, with like, that's a cool feeling to put something out in the world and have people see it and get feedback that, yeah, this is pretty cool. It was like, Hmm, I think I, w I have more ideas. Mm. I think I'm just going to do a video every month. And mm. I've pretty much been making a video a month ever since then. Yeah. I guess that follows similar. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. I've never been an engineer, mm -hmm. but I guess it follows a similar trajectory of like building something, putting it out into the world or putting it to, to use seeing how people react to it or seeing the feedback from mm. it and then iterating and doing it again. It's a loop. It's totally a right? loop. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, Which is really interesting because that, as creatives, that's what, we're, mm -hmm. that's what we're doing. Yeah. Every time we upload, we're like, oh, okay, what if we tweaked this? And what if we tweaked this? And now that creativity is, you know, has data involved in it. Yeah. Now you have a mathematical equation to say, if I do this, does it bump this percentage? Does it change the, the AVD? Does it change the CTR? I, I think you're you're absolutely right. In the same way engineering is a feedback loop and you build a thing, you test it, you tweak it. 
I think it's very, very analogous to, to creating content and seeing yeah. how people receive it. I would just caution. I think there is a danger too of being too involved in the feedback loop where you're kind of giving your power and like the future of the channel and the direction away to other people who are the people who are watching your content. Yeah. I think you need to know what they want kind of even before they do. And this is kind of like how Apple designs sure. products, right? Mm. They're the mm. forward thinkers. And they say like, I'm visionary enough to know if I make a video about squirrels like that. So the squirrel is a great video where it's like, I would explain that to people and they'd be like, okay, yeah, your channel has definitely finally jumped the shark. Like, what <laughs> yeah, are yeah, you yeah. thinking? When I'm like, I'm making a video about squirrels yeah. in my backyard. Like just friends and family are like, good luck with that one. Yeah, you know, like, is like, everything okay, Mark? Yeah, is that, <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's like the pandemic. This is yeah. what I've become, the squirrel guy. You're in like, the no, I'm telling you, I have a thousand hours yeah. of the squirrels. <laughs> You're going to love it. <laughs> Getting up every morning with the squirrels at 5 a.m. I had the vision in my head of like yeah. what that video, and I'm like, just trust me. It's going to be a banger, you know? And that squirrel video, we're here, you know, the day after you released squirrel 3.0 squirrel 3.0 and that's number one on trending right now oh is it right is that right yeah. i didn't even know that yeah um it is. i just checked okay <laughs> well but it's kind of like the thing where it's like right like if i put out a survey to all my followers and say what content do you want i promise no one was said we want to see you what can you do with squirrels you know what yeah. i mean yeah so it's like therefore if you get too caught up in the feedback loop and it's like well i did this one video so my whole channel needs to shift and, and that did well now you just need to be doing that thing it's like eh. I think what's interesting though about your channel specifically is that you can't even react quickly enough with the way that you make videos to follow a trend. <laughs> yeah, that's or right. Or try and predict what the audience <laughs> yeah, would want. Yeah. So I don't even try and yeah, that's right. Yeah, like I say on average my videos take about a year to make. And so mm. therefore right now I'm currently working on like nine or ten videos. Yeah. One of the first things I think about is like kind of what's the title thumbnail? How can I explain this in three sentences? If I can't explain it in like one to three sentences to you where you're like, dope, that's a mm -hmm. cool idea. It's not, a, for me, it doesn't work for my channel. My assumption is that pace also dictates potentially like a level of fear. Like if I have a lot of tries, Samir and I take a lot of tries throughout yeah. the year because yeah. we post almost every week. Right. So if we fail, we're getting right back on the horse and that's something else is coming out next week. Yeah. For you, do you find it to be more difficult because you put out so few videos? No, because, like because I, you, no. Don't, you don't feel that pressure. I, because I'm putting something out next month. It's all relative. Mm. Yeah. Like, I just kind of feel like you know a good idea when you have mm. it. And there's ideas that I'm like, no, that's not big enough. That's not, yeah. and I won't do it. But it's not like I've gone down that track for five months and then I scrap it. Like, like the elephant toothpaste videos where it's like, those are very risky. We spend a lot of money, go out there, film them you know, one of them, it blew out the bottom of it and it, it failed technically, but I leaned into that failure. And, and when, before it went up, I was making sure to look to the camera, like this may not work. We're not sure. And we kind of leaned into it and that became part of the story failure, but we learned and it was cool. So that, that's my process is like have general bullet points at the end of the day, though, you go out and film the thing and then you figure out how to make the story work. There's always a way to make the story work. Always, always, always. What were the inputs to push you to make your first video? I always wanted to be on the blog Gizmodo. Really? <laughs> it's really? just like kind of wow. funny. Wow. And then I had that Halloween costume that yeah. I took to a party, but I have an iPad in front, iPad in back. You do a FaceTime chat. It looks like you have a hole in your body. And people at the party were like, oh, that's, they liked it. That's cool. They wanted to take pictures. And so when I got home, I was like, I just handed my wife my phone. I was like, hey, just take a quick video. And then I uploaded it. And the next day, you know, front page of CNN and a million views. And I was wow. like, oh. and then I got on Gizmodo. So I'm like, I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> I've done it. You know, what was the follow up? So this is an example of another idea I had where you take those bucky balls, those little magnetic silver balls, mm -hmm. neo balls or whatever. And if you draw on a magnetic whiteboard, a, uh, a target, you can play darts with those magnets. So it was like, I know. Yeah, not a Mark yeah. Roper yeah. You guys clearly aren't impressed. Didn't, Roll yeah. the clip. Didn't react, cool. Roll didn't react the to that. Clip. You could throw it super hard behind the back, up top. And then I did like, I think how to film animals at a zoo with like, you use the front facing camera on your phone. You just stick it up to the glass and they mm. look at, they see their own reflection and they go oh, up and cool. look at it and you can mm. hit record and get that. So like, I really like the idea of using junk you have lying around your house to like make a concept because it just feels so approachable and obtainable yeah. and inspires mm -hmm. people that like, wait, 
I have stuff around my house. Like, yeah. what could I do? So anytime there's the option of like, let me just buy the expensive thing off the shelf and save me a little bit of time and just have it done versus let me make it myself with a little bit of duct tape and popsicle sticks and a motor that you find in this RC car. Right. I will go the ladder every single time because it just feels more obtainable for other people to have their own ideas, you know, and it yeah, kind of cool. breeds that kind of authenticity thing. It's not just like I just throw a bunch of money at this thing and it exists. Mm -hmm. It's like, I'm just a dude in his backyard making videos, you know? Yeah. I mean, your most watched video is incredibly obtainable. Oh, uh, skinned yeah, watermelon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like most four minutes attainable. long I and know. anyone could do that. That was actually the funny story about that is that was the first video I made at Apple. And when I went to Apple, I think I had like something like 300,000 subscribers. And they're like, oh, by the way, you can't make any more YouTube videos. And I'm like, you guys asked me to come work for you. Like they had approached me. I'm like, I'm not going to. Because of your YouTube videos. No, I'm not all. What you did with the iPad yeah, yeah, was yeah, fantastic. Right. If you could go work at Apple. Yeah. <laughs> so then uh, I was like, no, like uh, that's not an option. So they're like, fine, you can, but wait like three months. I was like, besides guys, you have nothing to worry about. Like my video doesn't get that many views. So literally the first video we're getting Apple, I did that, that, that watermelon one and it had like 30 million views in like four days. <laughs> and, and, wow. and in those time, those were crazy yeah, numbers. Was, and so I was like, yeah. <laughs> like, did they say anything? No, but the, it was like a weird, it was always weird with them, with my channel. Cause like when I first went on Kimmel, Kimmel asked me to go on and like, after I'd been there, maybe eight months and it made it all the way up to like a senior VP one level below yeah. Tim cook. And the response was like, we should be focused on making great products. So it wasn't like an actual no, but it was like clear that they didn't want it. Yeah. And then I was like, dude, I, you can't tell me what to do on my weekends. Like I, as long as I don't say I work for Apple, which I was never going to, you can't tell me I can't kayak. So you can't tell me I can't go on Kimmel. So I just did it, which obviously was a very good decision. Cause yeah. like we're very good friends now. And it was like, that's been a great, just a lovely relationship on a lot of uh, different fronts. So it's like, I'm glad I didn't listen to them. And then eventually it did get leaked. I worked there. There was a patent. This is all public, so I can kind of talk about it. But it's like, there's a patent about using virtual reality and self-driving cars. And I was like the lead author on the patent. And they, like a bunch of places covered it and said, this is like the patent of the decade. Like that's what, Pat, that's what like one of the Apple Mac rumors said. This is like a crazy patent, blah, blah, blah. And but no one noticed I was the lead author. Oh, wow. And I was notable oh, enough wow. at that time. They should notice. And then a year later, Variety, I don't know how, somehow realized my name was on that. And then they leaked the story and it was a thing. And for about a week, all my employees, because it said like YouTube megastar, Mark Rover. Oh. Where my, all my buddies were like, oh, you're a megastar. Yeah, and you said they were like harassing tough. me yeah, at yeah, Apple. Yeah, but yeah. it was like, yeah. it was kind of nice that I was like out that I work for Apple. Because then I just didn't feel this like, oh my gosh, the secret's going to leak Skeleton and then Apple's going to be yeah. super pissed. Right. And so then it was overblown. It wasn't a big thing. Everyone still says former NASA engineer. I kept telling Apple that. I'm like, nobody cares that I work for Apple. It's way <laughs> yeah. cooler that I work for a NASA. You've been one up by NASA. <laughs> yeah, so exactly. Yeah. So relax, guys. You have nothing. You're working like a, a very high-end job and making YouTube videos at the same time. Like throughout the progression, that's unlike anyone else's startup YouTube career. Yeah. Right? Was there... Was there something nice to the fact that like the YouTube channel wasn't your full-time job? Yeah, 100%. And, and that there wasn't financial pressure on those videos? Or did you feel any sense of pressure on the videos? Like, <laughs> yeah. What was that experience It's like? a good point. Uh, so uh, first of all, I'll say, and like, I don't think anyone who's watching these, I, I didn't say this for a long time because people didn't know like what kind of money you can make on YouTube, but it's like probably for at least two and a half years, I was making more money on YouTube than I was at Apple before right. I quit. You know right. what I mean? So it wasn't necessarily like a financial, part of it was a financial thing, but you're exactly right. Like, A, I'm a conservative engineer. I would say I'm a reluctant leader. I'm a reluctant, like, I will eventually do it if I have to. But like the idea of just like creating a massive team and all this stuff, it's like, man, the more I could keep it is just like, I'm just a dude who's making these videos. It's a hobby. It's no big yeah. deal. It just helps my own brain. You know what I mean? Yeah. Then feeling like this pressure, let's say I quit when I had 100,000 subscribers and was like, all right, and you know what? I'm gonna mortgage my house, I'm gonna take out a loan and I'm gonna right. hire 10 people. That is such a different frame of mind than I'm just a dude who works at this company who on my nights and weekends and spare time, you know, with even having a family and doing other stuff, like I'm gonna work on these videos. It's a side hustle. It's like but, such a different mind frame. Totally. I, but I think I'd have to imagine that 
making more money than your job at Apple on YouTube, like there has to be a level of excitement or validation or, or something attached to that. Yeah. A hundred percent. And also like all my buddies at Apple thought it was so cool. Like yeah. I had a senior VP call me into his office just cause like his kids says he'd seen the videos and he thought it was really interesting and cool. And he wanted to say like, Hey, I like this stuff, you know? And yeah. so like literally at work, I was getting more opportunities because of the YouTube stuff, you know, um, that idea, that's interesting. that yeah. specifically that patent about, again, that's public. So I can say this, but using virtual reality and self-driving cars that like I was the lead author on, like that literally came because one of the managers said, Hey, you're doing all these cool ideas for your own personal YouTube stuff what's your cool idea? What's your banger idea you're going to do for Apple? <laughs> and it was like three weeks later, I was sitting in a meeting, like getting some training on some finite element analysis. And I was like, I had this idea and I'm like, I started shaking. Cause like immediately, like most of the ideas and it's pretty extensive, a lot of different variations this came within like, I'd say 15 minutes. And I just, it, it was a challenge from the folks at Apple to, to do more YouTube stuff for, for Apple, Apple. Wow. you know? And it turned mm. out to be, I think like, a good thing for them. So when it comes to, you know, ideas, cause it seems like whether it's engineering or YouTube kind of in the business of ideas, you know, you're in the business of like thinking of something different and, mm. and trying to implement it. One thing I find really fascinating about you is how few ideas make it to air mm. on your YouTube channel. You're not a data guy, which I'm learning about, yeah. um, about you, but average views per video on your channel are significantly higher than that of Mr. Beast. Um, Really? Obviously, he has over 700 oh, yeah. videos. He has over <laughs> 700 videos, but on average, each one of your uploads performs you know, higher than his. You've also yeah. had a video cross 50 million views every year for the last seven years. Oh, really? I didn't yeah. know that either. Yeah, we're not data guys. <laughs> we have a data we guy. Yeah. Yeah. We have That's a data amazing. guy who's very helpful. Yeah, yeah. 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 But I, I do know that in the last seven years or something like that, I don't think I have any videos, if you yeah. discount the live stream, with less than 10 million views or something. Because over time, they get more and more. The, yeah. your, your consistency is insane. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know that there's another YouTube channel like that that mm -hmm. has been that consistent over seven years. Mm -hmm. But you also speak about this concept of the Super Mario effect. Mm -hmm. And I was curious if you could explain that, and then I'll ask my question. Okay, okay. Yeah, the Super Mario effect is basically like, no one ever plays Super Mario Brothers or some video game for the first time, it falls into a pit, and just like, oh my gosh, I fell into a pit, I failed, how embarrassing, I never want to play this game again. You're like... No, okay, crap, there's a pit right there. Okay, next time I'm going to come a little bit faster. I'm going to jump a little earlier. You immediately learn from the failure and you're like stoked to try again. Mm -hmm. And so that's very much my philosophy. If you can gamify your challenges and think of them like a video game, you can learn so much more. You can have more success and have fun while doing it. And by the way, this isn't just like me making this stuff up. I actually gave a challenge to my subscribers where we said, Hey, here's a, here's a coding puzzle. I want to see if anyone could learn to code and like 50,000 people did it. And the truth was there was like two versions of that test. One where you took away five points. They started with 200 points if you failed and one where you didn't lose any points. And you're like, well, what are these points mark? They're nothing. They're like mm. fake meaningless internet points that you don't get anything. You don't redeem them for anything. You just got minus five points or you didn't lose any. And the people who got minus five points, statistically significantly, they had success 16% less often, Yeah, which is like bonkers. And then when you looked at that, the reason they did is they tried a total of five times on average. The people who didn't lose points tried on average 12 times, which mm. is like, those are yeah, bonkers yeah. results. Yeah. And it clearly they saw it as failure and getting points off, whereas the other people didn't see it as failure and they wanted to try again to solve it. Yeah. They were focused on, on winning and, and defeating this thing and having success, whereas the others were so focused and the thing we reinforced them was the failure aspect. And like that one difference yeah. in, how you, in how you just conceptualize the challenge made all the difference. Hmm. And I think even now to take that to being a creator, I actually think YouTube Studio is the same point docking system. If you have a video mm. that's a 10 out of 10 or a, <laughs> you know, <laughs> something that doesn't perform well. And I think that's what makes it really scary yeah. to you know, continue trying when you don't believe you can or, or financial pressure, Yeah, you know, where it's, if, if creators put too much financial pressure on their uploads, yep. then all of a sudden you upload, it doesn't do well. And you did kind of get docked, you know, yep. or something didn't work. Yep. You don't have unlimited drugs yep. anymore because you have to pay rent. That's right. And I think that's all to say, like the goal is actually to get to that Super Mario effect to say, I'm in a position mm -hmm. where I can learn. Yes and no. I mean, and the other thing I want to be very clear about is like, 
having a 10 out of 10 video is a signal. Like that yeah. is information yeah. that you shouldn't ignore. Sure. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, agreed. Agreed. Going back to your point, yes, you don't have unlimited resources, but I, I, I just inherently disagree. You know, at the beginning, I had two iPads. That was my video. Right. My next video was like magnetic balls on a, on a whiteboard. Right. My next one was just like, turn your phone around and put it up to this thing at the zoo. Right. I didn't start with unlimited. Now I have yeah. resources and in some ways it's a competitive advantage. I, I think Jimmy would say the same thing. If you told us we can only spend $5,000 on a video, fine, $1,000 on a video, and you put me and Mr. Beast with 100 other people, I would guarantee that the two videos we put out, put us on a channel, have someone else on camera, and I think the way we would approach it would be, I think we'd be in the in the top percentage of people who had that $1,000 and did it. Like That sounds like a challenge that we should make happen. Like yeah, yeah. yeah that, that sounds like a good video. Even Jimmy says yeah. that if he runs out of money, he's yeah. still going to be making videos no matter what. But yeah. that's an interesting challenge where it's 10 people. Yeah. Maybe you increase the sample size. Yeah. Everyone has a budget of $1,000. None of those people can be on camera themselves. Yeah. So we don't know whose video it yeah. is. Yeah. That'd be funny. But, that, fun. but then you'd see my guys like, this is a can <laughs> But that uh, speaks exactly like yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, I, you kind of know that's true. Like you've, yeah. we've done that experiment already because sure. both Mr. Beast and I started with nothing. Like yeah. we didn't, yeah. Yeah. we fair, weren't fair. like gifted all this money. You know totally. what I mean? When it comes to the YouTube videos you're making today and, and what you're building here in this space, how do you describe it to someone? If I had to boil my mission statement down at this point, like what I'm about, it's like getting folks especially the young folks stoked about like science and education. You know, when I was young, you had Mr. Wizard's World and like Bill Nye, but you didn't have any cool engineers. I didn't really even know really what an engineer was when I was the age of like a lot of the years of my channel. So to be like a guy who's like trying to be aspirational to these kids and it's also like, like if something doesn't exist and you're an engineer, you can just freaking will it into existence. Right. That's the closest thing we have to a superpower. And stories are the closest thing to magic we have in this world. So it's like you combine those two things. I think as a kid, it just, I, I, I love that I'm able to do that. And, and that resonates with some kids. So it's like, it's the carrot approach, not the stick approach to learning. Because school could sometimes suck. And you're like, I hate this and I'm not good at math. But if I can get you into the, if I can get you into the video with a catchy thumbnail... And all of a sudden you're learning about chemistry reactions or how balls fly through the air and why, or what explosions are. And you've learned a bunch without realizing it. It's like, gotcha. I gotcha. You know? Yeah. It feels like right now the impact that you have is very much aspiration, inspiration. I'd be curious. Do you ever miss the impact that you had working at NASA, working on the Curiosity Rover that goes to Mars or working at Apple on products that potentially tons of people could be using? How do yeah. you think about the the difference in impact there? Yeah, it's a good point. Um, so there is an element where it's like, yes, I am not physically designing the piece of the rover that goes to Mars or working on that thing for Apple that will be touch a bunch of lives with this physical thing. But in my mind, it's like, it's a pretty huge net positive for what I'm doing now versus just what I was doing there. And now even with the Crunch Labs boxes where people physically are holding a product mm -hmm. and building and having that experience where they're engaging, not just their eyeballs, but their hands and viscerally getting into the trenches with me. Like that totally scratches the itch. I would say even in some ways more than doing just at NASA and Apple, because it's like my fingerprints are completely all over this versus being like a very small part of a big thing. The most aspirational career right now is to be a YouTube creator. Mm -hmm. Your trajectory was very different. You didn't leave to go full time until you had 10 million subscribers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you didn't leave until you had 10 million subscribers. You didn't rely on YouTube for, for money, mm -hmm. you know, for mm -hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to kind of dig into that a little bit more around that concept of trying and, and failing um, or destigmatizing failing when, you know, how do you do that as a young creator right now? Is mm -hmm. it that you have another job and make YouTube videos? How do you keep your yourself that nimble to try? I mean, one way I was able to make it the Super Mario effect and make it like this fun game is because it was my side hustle. There just wasn't pressure on it for yeah. me. For me, part of it was like the opportunity cost of like this thing I'd gone to school for. I had a graduate degree in. 
I really like the company and my people I was working with. But I would say, dude, even if you have a job at some company, even if it's like uh, it, it's not the most high paying thing and you don't love it, like the more it feels like a side hustle, the more you could keep doing that thing and then be stoked to get home and work on the thing and edit. I, I'm blown away by how much I was able to do on my own just mm -hmm. with the passion and the excitement of yeah. it, you know? You know, if you want to destigmatize failure and not it be so penalizing, you're like, well, in real life, there are points off yeah. because you don't have unlimited money. Well, stay with your normal job. Right. And that makes it so that there's no points off. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like that's a way to make, to reduce the penalty of failure of a video that doesn't pop because it's like, you don't need this YouTube thing. It's just a fun thing that you can play around mm -hmm. with in the same way that it's like, you don't get penalized in real life for, for failing on Super Mario Brothers. You don't get penalized because it's just your side hustle anyway. So who cares? Right. I mean, that's what I tell people. And they're like, I want to, I want to, I want to make a YouTube channel. It's like, okay, why do you want to do it? And I don't know what the right reasons are for you, but I'll tell you two of the wrong reasons, which unfortunately is the two main reasons that I find people want to do it. They want to be rich or they want to be famous. There's a very, very small window of what you would consider success. If those are your two metrics, very few people get those two things to a high level. And even if you do, you're not going to be happy. You'll find out that wasn't actually what you were mm. after. And this is like when a lot of people who are, who, 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 who commit suicide, who have money, who have like, they have fame, they're famous, they have a ton of money, they have adoration, they're super talented. And they're like, how could they do that when they had everything? And it's like, no, that's exactly when you do it. Because you realize that this thing you were chasing your whole time that you thought would give you happiness didn't. And so it's like, of course, at that point, you're like, oh, crap. Well, if these things didn't give me it, like nothing will. Mm. And so it's like, I, I f there's an analogy there for like starting YouTube to be rich and famous because you're chasing after something that isn't real. And even if you make it to the end of the rainbow, you'll realize like it was fool's gold in the first place. Mm. So if you want to, however, do YouTube to get better at a skill and to learn to tell stories better and to have it as a creative outlet and to make friends and to increase your community. Those were all great reasons. And then the window for success is so much bigger. There's so many ways yeah. to succeed that aren't tied to exactly how many subscribers or views I have. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's just like flipping it. On those, like the more vanity side of what mm -hmm. you talked about, those two things, being rich and being famous, why a lot of people get into YouTube. Mm -hmm. What's your relationship with those two things? yourself because you you do have those two right mm -hmm. and and i'm curious about your relationship with them now as well as on on the come up and on the rise mm -hmm. as you were starting to obtain more money obtain more notoriety more external validation yeah you know what's a relationship to that i grew up in an era on youtube like when i started youtube nobody did it to make money like you couldn't i think the partner program had just been introduced no yeah. one knew what an influencer was like so people starting in that era, like we did it for the true passion of it. And I'm an engineer. Like I have never, I hate public speaking. Like I had, I should say, you know, I, I knew at some point you guys were going to ask you the podcast and I'm like, yeah, maybe I don't really do podcasts very much. But then when I saw you guys on stage at uh, the creator summit, I was like, oh, these guys are chill dudes. They're like good guys. They know what they're doing. And, uh, and so, and I admire what you do, like getting in front of a crowd and being able to do that. Like I don't have that bone in my mm. body. I don't like it. Um, I feel like when I do speak, I can get into a video mode and it can be like a good, you know, like my Ted talks, yeah. they can be a good thing. And I think they can resonate, but I don't like it. The answer to your question is like, I've been very reluctant about it. Like I'm an engineer. I didn't grow up wanting to have the spotlight, wanting to be famous. Like I love the idea that it's like a superpower that when I yeah. meet a kid, like even like last week, this kid came up to me and he's like, is this you? And I was like, yeah. And he's like crying. And yeah. I'm like, oh, that is so right. adorable. Like, I'm like, right. oh, like, let's do a picture. You know, it's like, it's a superpower to like make a kid's day like that um, and to inspire them. Like that's the part I like about it. Like it's a superpower. But the idea of, I was at a dinner the other night and like at a nice restaurant, like a sushi restaurant, like, and like six individual like people or groups came up like asking for pictures, like while I'm eating. And so it's like for the first time I was like, right. Uh, it's like a thing where it's like, it's a, it impacts my life in a way that's like, it was never something I looked for or wanted. Having said that, I love when people do come up with me. I don't want like that to be the message because of the super power thing, but I feel lucky that it's not something I crave. Same with money. You know, I don't, I have enough money and that doesn't mean, oh, I'm super rich. It's just, I don't have a lot of stuff. I don't feel like I need a lot of stuff. So 
it's not my motivation. You know, I like the idea of having money to turn it into cooler stuff for this, but I don't have 12 jet skis. What was your respectable 11? You have 11. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not, of course. Yeah. You're not. I'm not, you're some, not crazy. I'm yeah. not crazy with like 12 jet skis. That would be okay. opulent. I was about I'm grounded. Ask, I'm a cool dude, yeah. you know? I was about to ask a question about how you knew when enough was enough, but clearly yeah, they're, they're yeah, 11. Yeah. 11, yeah. Yeah. that's nice. when I knew. Nice jet skis and we're good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How, no, how but that's, you, the, that's the beautiful thing of like, if you want more money, and this is like such like an old, like goes back to like an adage, but it's like, you can either you can either get more stuff or you can want less stuff. And I think the superpower to this, by the way, there's an actionable way to approach this, and it's gratitude. Mm. Like actively being gra- grateful. I was talking with CGP Gray. He's like another YouTuber, he's a really cool guy. But you know, the idea of a gratitude journal, like the end of the day, if you just actively think about three things you're grateful for at the end of each day, you know, that actually has a measurable difference on people's happiness and well being. It's such a simple life hack. Yeah. But like the key to feeling content with what you have, I feel like always so often can come back to just like regrounding yourself, realizing what you do have. It's kind of like when you get sick and how immediately you're like, how am I not amazingly grateful every day for just having a body that works? Like immediately you're so grateful for something you didn't realize you should be grateful for, right? So it happens every time. Every time. I can't even, I can't even envision what I was like healthy when I get sick. You know, you're like, you feel like you're never going to get better and you've never been better and you've never been better. But like the same thing goes by the way with like, if you, they've studied people who win the lotto or become a paraplegic. And for the first year, the people who win the lotto are, are happier and the people who become paraplegic are less happy. Yep. But after a year, on average, they've both returned to their baseline level of happiness before that happened. Mm. Where it's like we're super relative creatures and we kind of normalize to our situations. And that works. It's the same reason you have kids playing like soccer in like a war-torn country and you see the picture of them and they're right. laughing and smiling. It's like... As humans, our brains are able to normalize to our situation and get used to it. And that, but that goes both ways in a bad thing or a good thing. Mm -hmm. So if you think, if you're in this trap of like, if I just had X, if I just had this many subscribers, then I'd be happy. If I just had this, then I'd be happy. As humans, we, we work towards sometimes a future, a future situation we're trying to create for ourselves. And yet when we eventually get there, we're not even there to enjoy it because we're still working towards a future future. So if you can't be happy in the present, you will never be happy because you're working towards a future that if I just had this, if I just had this, you will always be doing this and you will never arrive. Mm. So it's like this, because you're going to normalize to whatever, like yeah. it's the key is finding happiness in your current situation. I think that comes down to gratitude. And that's not to say it's not, you shouldn't have goals. You shouldn't be challenging yourself because you should, and that matters, but I think a good checkpoint is like if you're putting spinning so much on your happiness with something that's happening in the future, that's a good sign that you're never going to have achieved that happiness. Even if you achieve mm-hmm. that thing, there will be something else for you. The thing I thought about when you just said that is like, I think we probably normalize high stress situations more than, mm-hmm. than others. Mm-hmm. Like we start to build in a way, like we've been making YouTube videos for 10 years. I can... I'm very comfortable in a very high stress Mm, scenario. mm, You know, I'm very comfortable with pushing myself to, to edit overnight. (laughs) Very comfortable with, you know, like I'm, I've, I've put myself in those situations. Do you think that there is a, I guess, is that just a side effect of, of this career we do? Do you fall into that at all? It could also Um, be survivorship bias where it's like, those who who are in this position able to make videos and do that are are those who keep doing it and those who like can't handle it like mm. filter themselves out so yeah. i don't know that the situation creates that is potentially it's also just like that is what it is those who can handle it and work yeah. that way um uh, but i yeah i for sure am and it's like it's something i tried to fix for a long time like to me it manifests itself as like procrastination where it's like I just can't psych myself out to start editing the video sooner than I know is like the absolute last minute. And even I'm like, I have the time. I'm going to start three weeks earlier. Pressure's on Mark. You better get this done. My brain's like, dude, you actually have way more time. (laughs) I know Mark said like, you got to do it. The pressure's (laughs) on, but it's not really on. Like you've got time, you know? And then I just can't take it seriously until it gets to the point where I'm like, oh crap, I am screwed. Yeah. Uh, I really, and then, and then my brain switches and I get in this flow state and then I'm like Mm -hmm. focused and it's like, I tried to fix it for a long time, but it's like, I don't know. It's working. 
And I, I, I'm not saying quite up as like 7 a.m. as I used to be like as much. And I can, it might be 2 a.m. or something. And it is kind of stressful at the end, but it's like I'm focused and I get it done. So yeah. I stopped trying to fix it and I just accept it. You also have to enjoy doing the work, right? Like rich and famous is not a lifestyle. And so many different creators can have so many different types of lifestyles. I'm curious for you, like, what is the lifestyle that you have? Like, what does it look like to be a creator? The type of work that you're doing on a daily basis? For me, it's like my favorite part about working at both NASA and Apple is when we could get into the white, the rooms with the floor to ceiling whiteboards and we were brainstorming and cool ideas and how do you do ideation? And like, so that's a lot of what I do now. Like a after this, we're going to go down and one of the, product designers on crunch labs has a, a demo that we've been talking about that he wants to show me and I get to see it and give feedback on it. And that's like, that gets my heart pumping so much. I love this. I know this is going to be in kids hands. We really go nuts on these boxes and make them like as awesome as possible to so the mm -hmm. quality that we put YouTube videos out and builds. Like we try and do that with these boxes. So a daily life for me is like a lot of the ideation and the fun and the creative. And now I've got, you know, I'm building up a team of folks around here again, reluctantly over time, like, all right, I've, I build up the team as needed, but they're very talented, creative people. And it is so freaking rewarding to support yourself, surround yourself with people who can, um, I mean, that's one of the things I'm learning. It's kind of a challenge and stuff is learning to build and manage a team. But like, if you find someone who's like really good, they can scale you mm -hmm. in a way that's like magical. In other words, take your, what you can do and multiply it by three or four. If you find a person who's not a good fit, they can do the opposite. And it's like a point, five effect you know like mm. they could take you multiply by 0.5 divided by two type of thing. you know what i mean it's like it goes the wrong way if you don't have the right person so now building up this team around me of really creative really productive people who are strong in ways that i'm not has been like pretty rewarding and, and cool and fulfilling yeah when but, it comes to the videos though you haven't necessarily scaled the editing oh yeah yeah no, no. so like i still edit and write my own videos you know i have an assistant editor who goes through all like the raw footage and stuff and helps me but you know even with the squirrel video again we're talking about that because it just got released like 12 hours ago but you know we had so many hours of footage and it was only till like three weeks ago that i finally sat down with all the footage and looked through it and said all right what's the story you know and so right. it's like i feel like the story is found in the edit even if i'm we do the world's longest field goal kicking robot and we take it out i have general points i think i want to hit in the video we'll go out and film it though and whatever happens happens and the very last thing I do on the videos is film the intro and the parts where I'm like, so today we're going to go out and blah, blah, blah. Mm. It's because I know at that point what happened and what the important parts are. So I'm going to focus more on today. You know, let's say we kicked a really far field goal, but wasn't accurate or the opposite. It was really accurate, but it didn't mm. go very far. Well, then I'm going to focus on the beginning. Like today we're going to just try and who cares about accuracy? We're going for the longest field goal kicking robot, right? Or if the yeah, opposite is true. Yeah, 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 yeah. Today, you know what? Instead of just trying to kick it far, I'm all about accuracy, you know what I mean? <laughs> so you can play to your strengths and yeah. craft the story around like the actual thing, right? Would and, you ever let someone else find no, the story for you? No, absolutely Why? not. Be, A, because I love it and I think I'm good at it. This is something Kimmel always tells me about when I tell him I edit my own videos and Beast as well, Mr. Er, I hate that I know two Jimmys. Mr. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Mr. Jimmy, Mr. Uh, Donald's and Beast. Beast. Yeah. He's like, dude, you just have to have other people like they'll be able to do it better than you. And it's like, I don't know. A, I don't believe that still, even though I think they're probably right. But I enjoy it and I love it. And I feel like that's the secret sauce and the heart. And I feel like it would be so obvious to people if suddenly I was like outsourcing that. And it's just like what I love. That's the thing that I tell creators when it's like when people are like, I feel this like applies to a lot of people who watch your stuff. Like they have the blueprint that it's like, okay, as soon as I get 10,000 subscribers, 50,000 subscribers, I need to quit my job. I need to take out a loan. I need to hire 10 people. I need to have an editor. And it's like, guess what? You're now a manager and you didn't get into this. And you haven't been doing this for four years because you love being a manager. You like creating. And pretty soon you just find you're managing people and dealing with people problems. And they're all depending on you for a paycheck and you're feeling all this stress. And it's like sucked the fun and the creativity and the life out of it. And now right. it's not the Super Mario effect. Because when you die, it actually has real world implications. Mm, yeah. So I think this is how we come back to your question, which is like, this is why I took so long to make it so there was real implications for failing. And by the time I did quit my job, I had enough money that there weren't that real implications for failing. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's mm -hmm. like I intentionally kept it so that you had more lives. There was yeah. more, yeah. I, I had more <laughs> lives. I did that trick on level three yeah. too, where you yeah. on the yeah. turtle yeah. shell, you know? 
I'm yeah. like, yeah. That's so interesting. It's like reducing the impact of failure or reducing the, the liability of failure. Mm -hmm. That's like so important to creativity. I think that's right. I think that's right. I th you guys are Oprah. You're, you're helping me find things about <laughs> myself. I didn't know why I do it, but now I'm discovering yeah, now things about my inner self. <laughs> this idea of burnout too. I think mm. this is, I think this is the reason why I feel like I've never really been burned out is because it's like, you know, I give the analogy and I have before where it's like, this analogy of like on a treadmill where it's like, it's really exciting and you're sprinting on this treadmill because you, you have all these things you're doing and you're hiring people and it is exciting and you get the dopamine hit to your brain and it's like, this is rad. But at some point you can't keep up that pace and the yep. dopamine that mm. comes from sprinting and being like, oh, I'm doing all these cool things wears off, but you still have to sprint because your treadmill's running at that speed. And like, that is the definition of burnout when it's like, you don't get the dopamine reward for the work that's going into it. So I'm very oh, protective wow. of my treadmill speed. I've okay. I love that. That's fascinating that you don't get the same dopamine reward. Like that that's so interesting because then you can you always have to push it more to get a new dopamine release. Well, because you're spr you're spread yeah. your your treadmills at a sprint. By the way, this yeah. is like again how we've evolved. Like that's not a that's not a bug, that's a feature that the dopamine wears off because Let's say you're a rabbit and a, uh, or, or let's say you're a squirrel because that's more apropos. Yeah, stay on squirrels. Yeah, yeah, yeah let's yeah. stay on brand here. <laughs> and you eat a walnut and you, you feel that dopamine in, in your brain. And that is such a pleasurable experience from eating that thing that you just, you keep that for like three weeks. This is the best walnut I've had, right? You don't have the motivation then to go out and to go find another walnut and to work hard to find another walnut for your family. Like there's a reason that dopamine feels good and then it wears off is because if you just rested on your laurels and just like, and, and you just feel that dopamine forever, that squirrel gets removed from the gene pool because other squirrels it's competing against find the next walnuts and mm. it's out of a meal. It's not mo It's not motivated. It doesn't have to go find a squirrel because it doesn't feel motivated, right? Yeah. So that chemical reaction is actually the thing that motivate. It wants you to remember that was lovely. And then it wants to inspire you to go get that again. So you can find the next mm. meal and out compete the other squirrels. And so that, that literally is like a feature, not a bug of like how our brains work that, that the dopamine wears off, but you have to know that. And therefore, don't oversubscribe yourself and get to a point because it will wear off. Yeah. And you need to be able to sustain that without like getting hosed. It feels like that's um, very similar also to the the photo that you have when you walk in here of your your email when you mm. first got yeah. comments on yeah. the iPad video. Yeah. Um, like you, you took a screenshot of, you know, YouTube emailing you that there's a new comment on, on, <laughs> your, on your first video ever. <laughs> There's nothing that will ever compare to that dopamine release. I know. Even though it's five or 10 comments or whatever it was, yeah. 20 comments, the first 20 comments you got. I remember our first YouTube video, it had 300 views on it. Mm. And I remember my brother and I went out to lunch and I, I felt on top of the world. And he was like, <laughs> he was like, dude, 300 people yeah. sat and watched your video. And there was yeah. likes and comments. And I was like, I will was never- Was that in the 301 plus era? It was in the 301 plus era. Oh, That's even wow. more. You didn't even get, you know, a little bit more. And it's like, <laughs> oh, yes. who knows how many views? Well, he, this classic Colin, you know, trying to make <laughs> me say, not that that's not exciting. Trying to cut down my dopamine You were so here. close to it being really exciting. <laughs> One more yeah. you, yeah. and you would have <laughs> and, assumed and, it was 10,000. <laughs> It stopped at 300. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Carry on. I don't even know what I was talking <laughs> about. Man. Mildly just, interesting. Yeah. No, <laughs> your point yeah. is interesting, though, where it's like the delta from. Like I still feel to your point, I'm chasing that high of that first iPad video Yeah, mm -hmm. is the Delta from zero to something is, is so much bigger than like, you know, something to a little more something. I mean, what did you do when you crossed 13 million subscribers? Um, I celebrated because 13 was such a milestone and Damn it mattered it. to me. I'm just okay. kidding. I'm just <laughs> okay. kidding. Right. right. I have no idea. Yeah. I have no idea. No idea, but yeah, yeah. you could probably remember a million. Yeah, for right? sure. I remember a million. I yeah. remember 10 million. Yeah. hundred percent. Right. It's so like those, those, you know, I, I do think it, we do get numb to it and I, I've never heard it like that, but that's really interesting. And the second thing I wanted to say was that when we were brainstorming concepts and titles for, for this video, mm -hmm. um, one that came to mind that we kept coming back to was why Mark Rober jogs and doesn't sprint. Mm. Uh, just cause it was coming off of our call with yeah, you, yeah, there yeah, was something yeah. very interesting about like, yeah. you've been so consistent across so many years yeah. and you're not. You, you came across even just in our short conversations yeah, yeah. with you of someone who's not like, oh, this thing happened. I have to get a video out. I have yeah, to do yeah, this yeah, thing. Yeah, You're yeah. like, 
you're jogging on this pace to, I love to, it. to you know, beat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can just keep going because no, you're no, jogging no. at a comfortable mm-hmm. pace. Yeah, I think it's great. I wonder if you'll. I wonder if that has the that might click, not translate. To well, a, that's what I'm wondering if it yeah. like if the clickbait ability is just like sure. oh yeah. like because because jogging's more comfortable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why, we're still. I mean, we're, we're still like, working on it. Mark, we're workshopping yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just saying, I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. conceptual. Why do you around? Just throwing around. Just, just, around. Guys <laughs> <laughs> just throwing around. Yeah. That's a classic Jimmy text. Yeah, I'm gonna a, get it from Mark now. Classic yeah. Jimmy. Text. <laughs> Why do you hate views? That's great. Um, you know, the videos are absolutely the engine of this whole place, right? I mean, I'm curious if it is one of the most impressive spaces we've been to mm. from a creator. If not for me right now, I was going to call you on one of, yeah. to be honest, for me right <laughs> now, I think, <laughs> I think the, the most, impressive. there we yeah. are. Yeah. Maybe we'll just start you at the most. Yeah. I'll just start yeah, that out. sentence over and say, yeah. this is, <laughs> this the, is most the most impressive place yeah. I've been to. Um, when it comes to, you know, a creator space, mm. there's obviously a whole team in here. This is, this is a huge place. Like does all of this, can you pay for all of this? Just from YouTube AdSense? Yeah. So like I started a, the company Crunch Labs. Yeah. Was we t- I accepted no funding. Got it. It was all self-funded. Cool. This place was all self-financed. Um, Crunch Labs has already paid me back. It's cash positive. Wow. But I, I mean, the answer is yeah. I mean, and this goes back again to being conservative. Like if people wanted to give me money, even to fund Crunch Lab, it's like, I don't want your money because now I feel like pressure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, it's like I had genuinely, I hadn't thought of it this way, but I guess I do frame stuff in a way that failure, even if it fails, it's not that big of a deal. And if I'm taking someone's money and they're mortgaging their house because they want to bet on Crunch Labs, now it's a big deal. So that's why I was like, no, like I have. I don't want your money and I'm not trying to be selfish. I just don't want to deal with that pressure. You know Mm. what I mean? I'm curious when it comes to the financial side of the business, Mm. being that you are friends with people in traditional entertainment, like Mm. you are friends with Jimmy Kimmel. Mm. I'd be just curious to know, is there something that he didn't understand about the business of YouTube that he now knows and that you also have learned maybe about his business? Oh, for sure. Like, I mean, he says that publicly that like he saw a future in me before I saw it myself, even still like, um, and he's like, I, we should do a TV show together. And he's like, I'm Jimmy Kimmel. I mean, he wasn't arrogant like that, but I think he expected me to be like, of course. Yeah. But he didn't understand. And we've had a lot of conversations. He's come to, I mean, it took like three long phone calls from him to convince me to even like, yeah, let's, let's explore this because it's like, I'll make way less money. Fewer people will see it and I won't have full creative control. Where do I sign Jimmy? Yeah, like, yeah. This sounds amazing. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think he's kind of come around to seeing like, he's really getting the understanding of like the creator economy and the yeah. power that comes with that. And that was one of the reasons why I think having seen that, he's like, you really need to do something like a crunch labs, you know? Mm-hmm. And so like I started going on that before you started seeing some of these other creators, like luckily, you know, also doing their own businesses that are kind of popping. I think four or five years from now, there's going to be a lot of articles about creators who are, you know, you will, there will be billionaire creators, right? a handful of them, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. You'll just start seeing it more and more and more. The direct to consumer with your influence, especially with the data darkness thing that's going on with like you can't track. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. It used to be really easy it's to not just easy to find audience. It's online not as easy to find an audience. audience if you don't have it. Can you yeah. explain that? The data darkness? Basically, yeah. yeah, you could track people, you know, you could Facebook collected everything. So if you mm-hmm. want if you had a, a widget and you wanted to find people who would want to buy that widget, it was pretty easy because they give you all the data and they say, yep. I love widgets <laughs> and here's my birthday. And here are the other yep. things I like. It's really easy to find those audience. Now with the data darkness where you can't be tracked and stuff and cookie policy, it's harder to find those people. And so I was always like, I cannot believe brands pay me as much as they do to do these integrations, you know, before I had my own business. And now that I have my own business, I'm like, those SOBs were ripping me off. Oh, like, you know what I mean? It's like when you have yeah. your own audience and your own company you can pitch, then it's like, oh, like, yeah. I was making them more money than they were paying me. And they, you know what I mean? And then, and sometimes you have the thing where they're like, well, it didn't perform as well as we wanted. It's like, no, dude, I know that's yeah. not true now. You know, mm. I think the other thing that creators should think about too, when, when, cause that comes down to like how you price yourself as a creator, mm. knowing your worth, knowing yeah, your yeah, value. Yeah. It's also like baked into the video forever. 
Uh, not For, really. Well, not, no, I guess unless, I you're a creator, my, unless you're a creator who takes out the ads. Yeah. yeah, I do. After a year, of course you do, because that increases your retention. Yeah. So whenever I do, this is advice to creators, make sure in your brand deals, you say it's like it's up for a year. And then you can go back and slice out that right, portion right. and get rid of that's it. You're the only the second creator we've talked to who does that. that, does yeah. that. Oh, really? First is Jimmy and yeah. the second now. I didn't even know Jimmy did it. Yeah. But yeah, I realized like, yeah, of course that's the way to do it. That's why yeah. we do yeah. these yeah. episodes. But that's <laughs> why we do these episodes. <laughs> so we can learn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if we look at the pie chart of like the Mark Rober mm. business, what does that look like now? Like revenue wise? Revenue wise. Um, AdSense, brand deals. You know, I don't know if you put Crunch Labs into that. Yeah, right I mean, now. if you put Crunch Labs, uh, maybe 50 50 brand deals, AdSense. Oh, wow. Yeah, what is it for most creators? I mean, it totally varies. It varies. Yeah. It, it, there's some creators that are 80% AdSense, and there's other creators who, like us, I would say we're 10% AdSense, you know? Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and eight, and ninety percent brand deals, ninety yeah. percent you know partnerships with with companies. But you're yeah. much more like mass audience. I think yeah. which yeah. lends itself to yeah, yeah. AdSense. Yeah, I think back right. to the concept of data darkness, like the the value as you remember or dig into what you're doing as a creator from a business perspective, is you're aggregating a certain group of people based on the content you're making, mm -hmm. right? So for us, like we yeah. are making content that is it'd be hard for you to be super interested in it if you aren't interested in the creator. Yeah, economy. yeah, that's right. You're right? like a definitely more niche. So yeah, we're yeah. very niche. So that means if, you, yeah, if that's you're right. looking for a place to advertise to people who are in the creator that's a good economy. Point. Then, yeah, that, that's a good point. Right? That's so really like that, that's where I think even as creators continue to build, like you can build a career with a niche audience that's if you're point. really specific, because, especially because it's harder to find the people who are interested in a certain thing. That's right. That's for, a really good point. And so now if, if you are going to create, uh, let's say your videos are like woodworking stuff, then yeah. you just need to find woodworking companies exactly. who yeah, will exactly. sponsor mm -hmm. you yeah. too. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then, and now with Crunch Labs, like I'd say Crunch Labs is significantly more right. than the other stuff. And I think- um, Significantly more than AdSense and brand deals. Mm, wow. Yeah. Wow. Because it's- That's um, a pretty short window for that to happen. I mean, we sold out in like five days and, and now we, we have a wait list of people who want and that was in the order of tens of thousands of year long subscriptions. And then, and we have a wait list now that's pretty significantly long. And then we're going to relaunch at Christmas with like a lot of product. Um, and, and most importantly, like we really put our, poured our just guts into these pro it's a good product. Like there's nothing yeah. out there on the market where yeah. you get like this banger video that I try really hard on the product itself alone is just a better product. And, and then you just have people who want, you know, selling this concept of like, I'll help you te to learn to think like an engineer. Parents are watching their kids be like, so stoked to get these mm. boxes and who now are telling these parents facts about projectile motion mm. and who now say they want to be an engineer. Like what parent isn't going to, first of all, uh. up, continue that subscription the next year. Second of all, tell their friends and family about it. It's interesting. Gift it to someone yeah. else. Gift too. it to yeah. someone and, else. And now you're talking about the base premise of what you said makes a viral video idea also makes a viral product just idea. Just makes a great product. Just makes a good idea, right? Yeah. Like it's a visceral reaction. The kid yeah. is having a visceral reaction That's right. because you're transforming them. That's right. They're, they receive this these pieces. Mm -hmm. They watch the video. They follow along. They build something they can interact with. They can shoot the Frisbees out. Yeah. Right? And then the parent is having a visceral reaction being like, that was a good idea for me to buy that for my kid. Yeah, 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 that's right. I'm a good parent. <laughs> that's right. And yeah. my kid is now yeah. doing something productive. Productive, yeah. They're learning their minds. Right. You know? So it's like all across the board, there's all these visceral, tangible emotions that are happening. Yeah. That are causing the virality of this idea. Yeah, I think that's yeah. right. I that's think cool. that's right. And like going back to, like I feel incredibly grateful that this is like so aligned with the core of, of what I am and what I want to do and, what my goals are, you know, I, I think you can make great products and you can sell them and, and they're great products and they make yeah. people happy. But if it's like, if it also strikes the chord of just like, it's so aligned with what I'm trying to do. It's, it's a freaking lovely combination, I which is why I say no to so much stuff. Like I'm very careful about what I say. I really try and swing from the fences and like pick my shots. And when this one kind of came around, I was like, Oh yeah, this is a good one to just, really swing for the fences of four, you know, you know, you've, you've launched crunch labs. You now have a company, mm -hmm. you know, beyond the, the Mark Rober, I guess, media mm -hmm. um, side of the business. Y you also mentioned that you think that creators, there will be, you know, billionaire creators because of this, um, because creators are launching companies. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, one thing Colin mentions a lot is around how 
this is the kind of entrepreneurship or, or product market fit flipped on its head mm. where, you know, previously someone would create crunch labs. They would say, okay, I have mm. these, I want to teach kids how to engineer. Now I need to go find an audience mm -hmm. for them. But now it's the inverse where it's, Hey, I have this massive audience interested in building and engineering. Let me build a company around that premise, yeah. which is, which is, I think why we're heading towards billionaire yeah. creators Agreed. is being a billionaire. One of your goals no. Or do you care about that at all? No. If I was even remotely close, like I just wouldn't, I don't think of it. I wouldn't think of it as even my money. Like I don't think that, um, you know, the idea of generational wealth is like so obviously, you're so obviously punishing the people in your family who come after you. Like mm. if I had a bunch of money, I would give my family like a very small amount and give the rest away. Like you were, even the idea of legacy seems so dumb to me where it's like, I want my name to mean something. It's like, yeah, you're giving your kids like an albatross, like mm. around their neck where it's like, if you're Tom Hanks' son, you will never be anything more interesting than Tom Hanks' son. Do you know what I mean? Like the idea of like, I want, I'm going to name a building after me. So it's like, people know this name. It's like, you're going to be dead. Who cares? Like, so like, I am the opposite of all of that stuff. Um, where it's like, yeah, with the money thing, I just, it seems so clear to me that like you should figure out ways to give it back and pump it back yeah. and like do something with it than getting that 12th to jet ski. You know, <laughs> I can, live with, enough, I can yeah. live with my modest yeah. 11, yeah. you know, <laughs> I don't need that 12. Everyone like is going to think you have 11 jet skis, yeah, by the way. Yeah, just so you know. I don't have 11 <laughs> jet skis. It's just 10. It's 10. It's 10. It's a respectable yeah. 10. Uh, I do uh, think that's a good, it's a good perspective to share because I, I too also like, I don't have interest in becoming a billionaire. Yeah. And I think it's, it's almost like, you know, something that you hear enough times as an aspirational creator or aspiring creator and you're like, oh, that's the goal. You know, you're, you're, or the oh, or, really people want to become billionaires. Know, or no, no, <laughs> I didn't thought about that for a second. Maybe not billionaire, but something to that degree. Like you're again back money to what minded, you said. Like yeah, money like minded, minded. Yeah, yeah, money minded. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I totally think that that's you know that's a that's a strange way to, to approach creativity and 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 a way that um uh, and push you to uh, probably make different types of decisions. It's not even strange. It's just wrong. Like and but the problem is it's like we could say this all day and people just have to experience yeah, it themselves. Yeah, they have to experience it themselves. Which yeah. is a bummer, but just trust me, it's like when you get to the point where it's like, you could just buy what you yeah. want and it doesn't matter. Like you're no more happier or less happier. It's like the lotto versus yeah, the paraplegic yeah, yeah, yeah. thing. But by the way, it's not even that it's like, it makes you more happy. It's clear to me that it makes you less happy. Right, right. Because then your relationships change with people. Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And yeah. you always are wondering, like, why is someone treating me this way? Like, right. it truly, I think, makes you less happy. Mm -hmm. and I feel like that's pretty obvious. Yeah. And so it's yeah. like the idea of... Now, that's not to say that, like, well, I don't want to make any money. But it's like, if I'm making money, I'm going to do something right. cool with that money that makes the world a better place. Mm -hmm. Not, you know what I mean? I don't know. So the money thing as being a motivation or a goal is just does not resonate with me. Right. Is there anything that makes you anxious or nervous in this career considering you've been in it for so long i i am shocked that i feel like nobody has it's so rare to have a long shelf life and i am shocked people are still watching my videos like i've just thought it would be an ephemeral thing and you know i think there's something to say that like i don't know i'm gonna try and hit short form like starting the first of the year but short form is a good example of something coming out of left field that like that's where all the eyeballs are going. That's the thing maybe that like kills the channel. I will say having the crunch labs piece is kind of nice. I do feel like it takes some pressure off of like having some diversification and like where I'm putting my eggs. It kind of does help with that. You yeah. know what I mean? It helps does give me a little bit of peace of mind that it's not like I'm putting all my eggs in one basket. And if suddenly something drastically changes with YouTube, um, having this alternate revenue source with crunch labs and as just of something to let the YouTube videos even be a loss leader. If right. I had to, yeah, is kind of nice. You know, the, Jimmy has this with like his gaming channel. Like mm -hmm. he has all those other channels that right. he, his main channel can be a loss leader. Like I now have something that can like help support all that. That has helped. Um, you've kind but, of created the, a bit of the super Mario effect also on the crunch lab. That's side, true. Right? Reduce the failure. Right? You've of reduced the, the, the impact true. of failure on crunch lab. That's a good point. You have the channel, 
And I think that's... Or the opposite. Or the even. opposite, sorry. Like, yeah. yeah. But when Crunch Labs started, it was that's right. channel. That's right. That's and right. now it can be Crunch Labs. That's right. And, then, and so it's, yeah, yeah, it's a really right. interesting lesson for creators to always think about, like, what is the, the engine yeah. that allows you freedom yeah. in the next project. Yeah. You know? But look, I'm also very caught. Like I won't, at some point people will get sick of my videos and like, I am, I know that's true and I'm, okay, I'm totally okay with that. Right. Like I had a great run. Like I have no, I have a ton of gratitude for just having had what have I've had. And it's a feature, not a bug. It's a feature, not a friggin' bug. At baby. some point, the dopamine release of watching a Mark Rober video is just going to go down and I'm like, it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> we had it. We, we had a good run though. We had a good run, you know, it <laughs> is that that's going to stick with me a lot. The concept yeah. of it's a feature, not a bug. I, I, I will think about that a lot. You know, you don't have a five year plan from here, right? Mm. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, that's right. What is the thing in front of you right now that you're trying to tackle? Like, what is the, the challenge you feel like right now? in the business, in, you know, your world that, that you're stepping forward to that you're trying to tackle. Yeah. For right now, it's like definitely crunch labs and like learning to, I kind of enjoying the challenge of managing a team and picking yeah. the right people. And we're not going to do a bunch of different products. We have like the build box, which is like the thing mm -hmm. we're going to mm -hmm. do one more and that's it. We're going to have a store. We're going to be like the Apple approach. I mark my words five years from now we are not going to have like all these different lines of boxes we're keeping it very simple mm. kind and of you're gonna have a, a physical space like a physical store is that what you meant no, uh, online you, store got it. got it not a physical store but i'm just yeah. saying like there'll be the um the, the younger kind of box mm -hmm. maybe one that's a little bit mm -hmm. older and then if people want to just a really really cool online toy store with creative toys yeah it's those three things full stop period so i'm I'm not going to, the same way with the YouTube channel where I'm not going to hire a hundred employees just for the sake. I'm not going to go get VC funding and yeah. scale up just for the sake of funding. We're just going to do it right. We're going to do it slow. There's no rush. I talked, I talked with, um, Eric, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. and Ryan Trey. I guess I didn't, I remember this, but he's like something you told us when we were at like one of the creator games was like, I, I'm not in a rush. Like where I feel like I had to do five videos a month. So Ryan, did his like mm -hmm. great series mm -hmm. or when, but penny series, yeah. yeah, his penny series. But then he was like, it's okay. Like take a month off, like right. YouTube two months off. I released six videos in the last 12 months, except for like now I'm pumping them back out. Cause I yeah. was kind of stockpiling, but it's like, just wait till you got that banger and it's when it's ready to be released and release it. And don't feel like there's no rush to become the biggest creator. Like immediately, mm. like do it right. Take your time. Enjoy yeah. the ride. Do you know what I mean? Like, enjoy the ride. If you're not enjoying the present, like, what are you living for? You will never arrive at the moment where mm -hmm. you, like, feel happy about things. So I really, like, right now, I'm really trying to enjoy the early stages of the company and growing it. At the same time, like, growing the YouTube stuff and just, like, making videos there that I enjoy. And I don't know. Is, you know? The, is there a world where, let's say, like, you know, people are over your videos at some point, but they're not over Crunch Labs, or you'd be happy just kind of running Crunch Labs? Possibly. I would say it's more likely that I would just be making videos for 50,000 people and that Got I it. would, someone else could run crunch lab. You know, I could yeah, be involved. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I I, I, I don't know. Again, that goes, you're asking me about a rock that's yeah, you don't know. three quarters of the way across the river. I don't, I haven't got to that point yet. Yeah. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I don't worry. I don't lose sleep over that. Mm. All I know is my challenges for the next week, month, right. three months. You know, I want big picture stuff a year out, but beyond that, it's your crystal ball is just as hazy as mine. And anyone who tells you theirs is clear is lying. That's great advice. <laughs> yeah, I like that a lot. And don't believe yeah. them. They're just making stuff up. I yeah. feel uh, very, uh, you know, I, immense sense of gratitude for you spending the day with us and, yeah, and giving you. us your perspective. Any parting advice to creators? Um, I don't know. Hopefully, I guess I'll say this. Like, I started YouTube at the right place at the right time. I've got really lucky with like a lot of things that have put me to where I'm at. And if I were to go start from scratch today, like there's, I just don't think in 10 years I would be where I'm at. Like I just got really lucky with things. Mm -hmm. So I hope you feel inspired, not like bummed out somehow because <laughs> yeah. it's like, we're yeah. talking about, I'm an outlier. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. even though I'm an outlier, like don't results are going to vary. Take something that applies to you and hopefully it levels you up a little bit, but don't compare yourselves to the Jimmy Donaldson's of the world and, and mm -hmm. feel sad when you're not getting what he gets. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like his amount totally. of views. I think our, our career path has been completely different from what I thought it was going to be because yeah. I was comparing, you know, to other creators career paths. And then once you experience it yourself, you're like, Oh, and again, I think, 
for me in sitting and talking to you and even spending the day here, what feels like a big takeaway is like choosing where you want to receive your feedback from, mm. like choosing what you want your feedback loop to be. Yeah. You know, yeah. like what, what are the, when you put the inputs in, mm. what are the results that actually you're looking for? Because it's all subjective. This yeah. isn't objective. Yeah. You, you said one time like that you, you love like math and physics because there's like a single source of truth. Yeah, yeah. I don't believe there's a single source of truth when it comes to success on YouTube. Yeah, agreed. And I think that's the thing that you have to be very wary of, of defining everything based on a single source of truth. Yeah. And don't say success therefore is views and subscribers. Exactly. Like it can look totally can look different totally for different, different people. Like you guys are crushing it with what you're doing and you don't have the average views for video that Mr. No. Beast does, but like yeah. in your world and what you're trying to achieve, like no one is doing anything close to what you guys are doing. I appreciate yeah. that. Appreciate yeah. it. We will definitely use that in a sizzle. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, cool. Thanks, no, Mark. Cool. Thanks, Mark, yeah. for All having us right. today. Awesome. Really appreciate cool. it. All right. What do you do at the end? Do you do a fist bump? You just or keep you going, all right. Oh, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks, all right. Mark. And like yeah. the music's yeah. playing and it's like <laughs> yeah. fading out. All right. All right. We're, all right. we're cool. playing you out right Is now. Is it credits are rolling <laughs> yeah. now? Okay. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. <laughs>